The following is a CNN special report. My grandparents, they offered to fly me because it would be faster and more convenient. Her first trip on a private plane. We just went up and I was like, that was fast, that was easy. Becomes sheer terror. It was all white and then it was all trees and then it was all fire. A fatal crash. All I could smell was my hand burning and I could smell my hair burning. A sole survivor. I was trying to pull him out and I just couldn't do it. And the desperate fight to stay alive. There's no way I'm gonna let myself die like this. How did she do it? Did you think at some point, I'm not gonna make it, I'm gonna die? Tonight, a CNN special report. It's a miracle. Sixteen-year-old Autumn Veach is a young woman going through typical teenage angst. But she'd found things she loved, her art, her friends, her music, and going on social media on her phone. But in an instant, Autumn's life became unimaginable. I came here to Bellingham, Washington to talk to her about the tragic plane crash and her amazing journey to safety. Can you tell me how it came to pass that you ended up going flying with your step-grandparents? Well, um, I was visiting my mom in Montana and I was trying to find a way back and my grandparents, they offered to fly me because, you know, it would be faster and more convenient. So I was like, okay, sounds good. Their Beechcraft A35 plane roared to life. Autumn's step-grandparents were up front. How close were you with them? I mean, I met them probably two years ago when my mom and their son got married, and they've been nothing but absolutely kind to me. During that visit I was having with my mom, I stayed with them for a few days. We went, we saw movies together, and I stayed at their house for a few nights. Leland Bowman was at the controls, his wife Sharon beside him. Had you ever flown in an aircraft of that size before? Not of that size. I mean, a, a while ago, I was in some commercial flights to go to Arizona, but that's it. When you first took off, because in a small plane, it feels different, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, when you first got in the plane and took off, and what was the sensation like for you? We just went up, and I was like, oh, well, that was fast. That was easy. We took off so fast, I was like, OK, there we go. What did you see as you were flying along with your grandparents? A lot of trees, a lot of mountains. I was texting my friends like, I'm on my way home, can't wait to see you guys. And she was posting pictures. This is Autumn on the plane. And I know that you sent a text to your boyfriend. What did that text say? Well, when we started hitting some turbulence and stuff, I mean, I was anxious about flying in the first place. So I was like joking and I was like, ah, if I die, just remember I love you. Her boyfriend didn't find that funny, but no worry, they had planned to see each other soon. Once you made that text, how long after that did the plane actually start having some problems and you start noticing there's a real issue here? Maybe around 20 minutes. It really wasn't much longer. I mean, there was probably like one text after that. And that was just me like telling him that I was trying to find the address for the airport because he was supposed to pick me up from the airport. And I was like, oh, I'll get the address and then just didn't ever respond. And the plane never made it. At 321, the plane dropped off the radar. And we were kind of, you know, flying through mountains and stuff because we couldn't go very high because it's a small plane and you aren't supposed to do that, I guess. And we couldn't go like above the clouds because then we can't see down. And then a close call, a near crash. We almost crashed the first time we went through some clouds, but he took like a really sharp turn and was like, phew, that was a close one. And I was like holding onto the back of his seat for a dear life, like, okay. <laughs> you were nervous, you were getting I was, scared. I was scared, yeah, and I figured we'd be okay, but it got way too cloudy. 
we would drop a few feet every once in a while. That was like a part of the turbulence, kind of the bumpiness. Like we would just drop a few feet. We completely lost sight of what was going on at all. Like all the windows, you couldn't see a single thing. It was all white and GPS wasn't really working. And I was kind of freaking out really bad. And I just kind of hunched down a little bit because I was scared and I was like, hey, well, they'll, they'll sort it out. It'll be okay. But I'm still like panicking, freaking out. And then he, they both started freaking out, kind of yelling, like, turn the GPS back on. And Leland said that he was just going to go up. They would just try to fly up. Panic turned to doom quickly. Because they were in the mountains. He's like, we're going to crash to the side of a mountain. I can't see anything that's going on. Tell me what you remember of the sensation of actually going down in an airplane started to go up and then it was all white and then it was all trees and then it was all fire. Next, the unthinkable. Autumn's grandparents trapped inside the plane. I was obviously scared to be alone in the middle of absolutely nowhere. In the wilderness, hurt and stunned, 16-year-old Autumn Veach found herself alive inside the burning wreckage of that small plane she'd just been riding in. But staying alive would mean quick thinking and finding the courage she never knew she had. I was seat belted in and I was in the back. You're supposed to climb in through the front doors. I don't know how I got out there. Might have been like a hole in the side or something that I climbed out of. Once you were down on the ground, the plane had crashed, it was on fire. What did you do then? And what did you see around you? I just, I got out, it was fire, like that's how my face got burned and like my hair was burning and stuff. But she says her grandparents were trapped. My immediate response was to go and try to help them out. And I was, I, there was no way I could get to grandma because she was on the far side and there's nothing I could do, but I assumed if I got grandpa out first then maybe she, she would come out but I was trying to pull him out and I just couldn't do it like there was a lot of fire and I am a small person <laughs> and uh, that's what happened to my hand I was trying to pull him out but there was a point where it was like well oh, he's there it's just not happening and there's nothing I could do Leland and Sharon Bowman perished inside the plane and it would take a miracle for Autumn to make it. How did you go forward from that point? My instinct was to go downhill, just so I started going downhill. I mean, I was obviously distressed, crying, and really scared to be alone in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I didn't, I didn't even know where it was at all. I don't know what city it was or anything. I still really don't. Do you have anything to help you survive? I wasn't carrying a single thing. What was around you? Just trees, trees and trees and trees. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't even really see the sky at the time. I was like, I should listen for a freeway or a highway or whatever. I should listen for, you know, anything, anything. But I couldn't find anything. And I was just running and tripping. I fell so many times. And I ended up falling off the side of a cliff. How far did you fall? I'm not positive. It, it really just kind of stunned me for a second. Then the discovery that saved her life. I got up and kept moving. And then shortly after, I found the start of that stream that I followed for the rest of the way. Burned and shaken, she was still in shock. It was a lot of adrenaline. It was adrenaline kind of pushing me forward and reason I wasn't feeling my hand burning and feeling everything that was happening. What was your body like physically? What kind of problems were you dealing with? The thing I was thinking about most was my hand because it was blistering and I'd never seen anything like it. And all I could smell was my hand burning and I could smell my hair burning and my face hurt. And so did her heart. I was blaming myself for what happened to my grandparents and why were you blaming yourself? Because, you know, I mean, I tried to help but I couldn't and it hurts not being able to help because they did matter a lot to me. And there was a lot of remorse and sad feelings and stuff. 
She was soaking wet and freezing from the cold. That first day, a lot of crying. And I mean, as soon as it started getting dark, I was thinking like, I should find a place to sleep. So I found a place that kind of was like indented that I could kind of climb into a little bit and just slept on the ground. It started getting really dark, so I was thinking like, I need to find a way to get warmer. So I put my knees up to my chest and just like put my head down in my knees and wrap my arms around and literally used my breath to keep myself warm. Did you actually sleep at all those two nights in the wilderness? I, it's hard to say because there was so much on my mind and I can't tell if I was dreaming or if I was just thinking really hard because it was really impossible to sleep, but I'm sure that there was some kind of unconscious state. It was the second day of her trek. Things started to look a little bit hopeless for me. Like, what are the odds? I'm just some 16-year-old girl, like, in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And I just started getting really hopeless. Did you think at some point, I'm not going to make it, I'm going to die? I was certain I was going to die the second day I was living outside. I was certain I would die of hypothermia because I was freezing, and it just didn't seem likely that I would make it. Up next, Autumn's incredible survival instincts kick in. I don't know where it came from. All the odds were stacked against her. Autumn Veach had survived the plane crash, but she was lost in the remote wilderness without any of the tools she needed to survive. Time was running out. What were some of the thoughts coming to you? I just started getting really hopeless and was just freezing. And I was like, well, I'm going to die of hypothermia. Like, that's obviously what's going to happen. Before dehydration or starving or anything gets to me, it's going to be me freezing to death because it was so cold. I was just so positive I was going to die. And it made me really sad because there's a I, I started thinking about all the things that mattered so much to me that I didn't realize mattered before. And like what? What were some of the things that came to you? Just little things. Just little things that you don't realize that you love, like, like your pets or your favorite songs or, you know, family, friends. I was just thinking about everything and how I would end up dying without ever actually telling anybody how much they actually meant to me and stuff. And there was that last text she sent to her boyfriend. I would leave my boyfriend on this, you know, weird cliffhanger joke thing where I was just being funny about dying and stuff. And she had regrets about how she left things with other people she loved. That was the last thing I texted anybody and how irrelevant it all was. And it just got super sad. And I was just thinking like, <laughs> there's no way I can die feeling like this. This isn't fair at all. And I just, a lot of crying, a lot of crying. And then um, I just, I don't know where it came from, but I just got like this huge boost of like, motivation like it it went from me being sad about those things to me being like angry about them like that's not fair at all I mean I'm not the best person ever but I don't deserve to die like this like there's no way I'm gonna let myself die like this like I have to move I'm not gonna let myself die this way this isn't fair and it's not cool at all wet cold injured the sole survivor of a fatal plane crash Autumn Beach picked herself up and started walking. She remembered TV survival shows she watched with her dad growing up. You gotta just follow running water down and it always is a civilization. It was harder than it sounded. Just crossing that river over and over and over again was so difficult. It was really slippery and I just got dragged down a little bit and had to get up. But she kept on going. And as I was walking, I was just thinking like, huh, you know what would suck like really bad if there was waterfalls? Then a sound off in the distance. Huh, 
What's that sound? Is that a freeway? I just kept walking and I saw uh, just a drop and I was like, that's a waterfall. It's a waterfall. It's a waterfall. I don't know what to do. But she did know one thing for certain. She wasn't giving up. I sat down and like mentally prepared myself for a minute like, how am I gonna get down either side of this? There's not really anything to grab onto. There's not any way to get around it and stuff. And I can't lose the stream because that's, that's my way out, you know? So I just decided to scale down one side of the thing and I made it. I mean, I made it down and it was about 20 feet. In your converse, in your leggings, you had- In my burned up hand. Yeah, I made it down though. And it was just a huge relief. Could you yourself believe that you're here and still alive after all of that? Well, I mean, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird to believe. I mean, I never thought that I had it in me to go through all that stuff. I'm kind of a huge wimp. A huge wimp who surprised herself with her own determination and will to fight. I'm the kind of person who struggled with, you know, finding a will to live and stuff. and. I mean, I'm a sad 16-year-old. A lot of 16-year-olds, or people in general, they struggle with things like depression. They struggle with being negative. Did you have those struggles? Yeah, yeah, really badly. I struggle with those things every day. Everything I said was negative. But now, even in the most negative of situations, lost in the woods, she found a way to keep going. Tell me what the moment was when you realized, I'm out, I've made it out. I saw a bridge. I saw a bridge and like my heart dropped and was like, is this real? Am I hallucinating or something? Like, am I going crazy? What's up? And I went up to it and there was a trail leading off the bridge and I walked up it and found a parking lot and there was one car there. There's nobody by it. I didn't see anybody. Finally, a road where she tried to flag somebody for help. Are you waving people down, telling them please stop? Yeah. I was out there for like an hour and it's like a freeway. There's so many people and everybody just ignored me. Like nobody even slowed down. Autumn had hit her limit. And I was sitting out there by the sign, leaning against it, and that's when my muscles started to shut down. Like, it hurt so bad just sitting still. She was feeling the effects of dehydration, muscle damage, and despair. But then, a glimmer of hope. A red car pulled in, and there were two guys, and I started crying, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's somebody here. They agreed to drive her to the nearest convenience store, and she called 911. So tell me exactly what happened. Um, I was riding from Kalispell, Montana, to Bellingham, Washington, and about, well, I don't know where, but we crashed, and I was the only one that made it out. When you made that call, you sounded unbelievably calm. Were you? I was in calm, I was in shock. I mean, listening to that sounds so, it, it haunts me now, it makes me feel so weird. I, Cause okay. like, I wasn't feeling calm. I was, I mean, I had spent three days like out, like sobbing and freaking out. Like I just was so still and just kind of everything hurt and I just didn't have the energy to cry more and to whatever, you know, I just, and I was kind of grieving in the way I do, which isn't, you know, it takes a while. It's very personal. And I was just wanting somebody to come get me. I just wanted to go to the hospital. I, it was, I was in so much pain. I'm gonna send someone up to come help you there at the Manzama store. Just don't go anywhere, okay? Okay. In the ambulance, Autumn called her dad. He was happy, <laughs> like. He was super relieved and excited and happy. It seemed like a miracle. There's no way I cannot believe in God. Even seasoned search and rescue workers were in awe. It is a, it is a miracle. It is definitely a miracle that she survived, and we're so happy about it. I'll just tell you this. From all of us here, we're just impressed with her. She's kind of like a superhero. I mean, everyone is talking about how impossible the scenario was, and you made it. I don't know how. I have no idea. I mean, it's, it's impressive. Autumn was finally reunited with her friends and family in the hospital and is home, healing. But everything is different. 
It sounds like this has really changed you. It really has. I mean, beforehand, very intro I'm a very introverted person. I'm very shy, very quiet, and relatively negative. But this really gave me a newfound respect for life. Like, I have never loved being alive more and having a second chance to be grateful and happy. Thank you.